and grieve the loss of many, many lives. And while many frantic Americans were running away uh, from the devastation that happened at the Twin Towers, there are hundreds of men and women that ran to the danger. And among those that died, there were 412 first responders. 343 of them were firemen, 60 of them were police officers, and 80 or 8 of them were EMTs. But the numbers didn't stop there. Because over the last 16 years, there have been over 70 police officers that have died as a result of some of the illness connected to the attacks on that particular day. But from its ashes grew hope, hope for a stronger country, hope for uh, strengthened relationships, hope for a better tomorrow. But as soon as that hope began to take root, it began to quickly wither away. Other forms of, tra of tragedy have taken place over the last 16 years, and of course we're reminded here in the last couple of weeks. First of all, of all in Texas, the third game, uh, Harvey, and then even today, right now, in Florida, Hurricane Irma. Doubtless there's going to be men and women that are going to be fleeing to those situations to be of help, to show forth bravery, and we thank them. And of course, our hearts are with all those people today as they are uh, struggling with flooding, and struggling with homes and work, and all the things that are going on. And while here in Hawaii, we don't have to necessarily face such horrific disasters as continually as we may see them over there, uh, we do have men and women that place themselves in difficult situations, nevertheless. Many making tough decisions on a regular basis, uh, battling uh, against domestic violence, battling against drug abuse, uh, battling against fires, uh, battling against uh, horrific traffic accidents, and even the occasional death. And we thank you for your bravery, and we thank you for the, the willingness that you uh, place yourselves in those situations to be of service to our community and to our fellow uh, countrymen here. And so today we say thank you. We want you to know that the people of our community, the people here at Big Island Baptist Church, we love you. And we pray for you. And we appreciate your care for us and our country. Before we go any further, I would like to bring a short message. And our people really like the short messages. When I say the short message, it can range anywhere between 10 minutes to an hour. So I, I don't know exactly how long it's going to be, but I intend to be a little bit shorter. I would like to bring you a, a message, a Bible message concerning those that are in authority. What does the Bible have to say about those individuals that are in authority? Authority. Why, why do we even bring up such a topic? Because uh, this generation that's growing up, uh, they're being taught something contrary to the Bible concerning those that are in authority, concerning what God uh, demands and commands each and every one of us as citizens, but also as Christians. And how do we respond to those that are in authority? Now, typically you say, no problem, you just respect those in authority. But there are going to be times when, when those that are in authority may make decisions or uh, maybe create policy or, or take our country in a different, different direction than what we want, than what we feel is right, than what we feel is biblical. So how do we respond to that? How do we train our children up? Because I really believe that our country is in the balance, and I believe that our next generation of children are looking for examples in the adult authorities that, that be on how we treat authority. Policemen, firemen, EMTs, civil servants, the President of the United States. I think the Bible makes it clear, really clear. The Bible says in Romans chapter number 13, if you have your Bibles this morning, you can turn there. Romans chapter number 13, verse number 1, it says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Now, what are those powers that be? Well, those would be our police officers, our fire department, our uh, civil servants. Uh, those would be our president and, and those that are under his command. You say, are we supposed to obey those people? Absolutely. We're supposed to obey those people. We're supposed to subject ourselves to those individuals. Why? Because God has ordained them to be 
those positions. There is only one mighty power, and that is the power of God. And he sets up governments, and he takes down governments. And those that are in authority have been given that responsibility by God Almighty. And we're supposed to respect that authority. He goes on to say, Whosoever therefore resisted the power, those powers, let's just say here this morning our police and fire department and our civil service, because those are the ones that are represented, and those are the ones that we want to address this morning. Whosoever therefore resisted the power, resisted the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation, not speaking of help, but judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to do evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise in the same. The idea is that God has set them in power and authority to suppress those that would want to bring evil. Evil to our community and evil to those that are on the streets. And so we lift them up. Those individuals, our police officers, etc., are ministers of God for the good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, or the taser, <laughs> or the glock, or whatever it is that we're wearing these days. For, the, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that do with evil. Honoring those that God ordained is an obligation that we have. It's a responsibility that we have as Christians and as citizens. It is an authority that has been given to them by God Almighty. There will be ramifications in not honoring them, not lifting them up, especially for this next generation. Especially if they're not taught to love and to honor the position of those that are in authority. So what is God's view of government? How does God want us to relate to the governments that He has set up? Well, it says in verse number 1, let every soul be subject unto the higher power. So our first point is this. As Christians, as citizens, we need to subject ourselves to the higher power. Now, why is that even an issue? Because within every man and woman, there is, there is something within us that does not want to submit to authority. You, you tell any kid not to do it, the first thing they're thinking about is how can I do it when you're not watching. Don't touch that. When you leave it, I'm going to touch that. There is something within a man, within a woman that wants to resist authority. And so it is difficult for men, for women, to sometimes submit to the authorities that be. Now I want you to notice that in that verse it does not distinguish between good and bad rulers. We've had all sorts of different presidents over the last 20 years that, that range from one end to the other, and we say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm nowhere in between and all of that, and, and, and yet there's a position and authority that they have that we need to subject ourselves to, that we need to honor. If you can't honor the man, you honor the position. But the view that God wants us to take concerning those that are in authority and especially government to put ourselves under their authority. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 says this, Submit yourselves every to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king supreme or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. The first point is be subject to the higher power. The second point is this. Be in prayer. Be in prayer. Uh, our officers, fire department, police department, we want to let you know, and our mayor, that we pray for you. We pray for you. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, it says this, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all goodliness and honesty, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God 
our Savior. Our first responders, uh, we want you to know that we're praying for you, but not just you. We know that amongst police officers, especially police officers, but also amongst fire department, that divorce is quite high. We know that a lot of times you take your work home with you and it's hard to separate all those things. And so we want you to know this morning that not only do we pray for you, but we pray for your family. We pray for your marriages. We pray for your children. We pray for your safety. This is a crazy day that we live in. We, we, you don't even know what to expect. You don't know what's coming at you. We read about, we, we, we watch things on the television, people just coming by and pulling their guns and squad cars and firing away. It's a crazy world that we live in. As I shook many of you guys' hands and slapped you on the back, I noticed that you're not just wearing your shirt. Of course, you have to have some protection there. So we do pray for that. We pray for your protection. But not only that, we pray that God will give you wisdom. How to deal with the situations that you come across. We pray that God will give you discernment. How do we how do we communicate love and hope to people that are in a desperate situation? How, how do we how do we get these people calmed down? How, how do we navigate through all of this? And, and in every situation is going to be a little bit different. As you approach fires and, and you approach traffic accidents, all these types of things, we pray that God would give you wisdom. God would give you discernment. We also pray for your character. That you would be the best that you can be. That you would serve with dignity. That you would serve with pride. That you would serve with honor. That you would represent your family, your city, your state. But all, ultimately, that you would represent God in a way that brings Him honor. Also, we pray that there would be unity amongst yourselves. You know, with such... Uh, uh, well, for a while, I was in the fire department in Kuna, Idaho, and there's a lot of strong personalities. I'm not sure how it is in the police department or even the fire department here, but there could be lots of strong personalities, right? So we pray that there be unity amongst yourselves. You work together, uh, and that, that you would you would look to the good of, of your community first and foremost. So we pray for you. We pray for you. Not only. Are we supposed to be subject to the higher powers and pray? But thirdly, the last thing this morning is this, that we be respectful. As citizens, as Christians, that we be respectful to those that are in authority. There's nothing wrong with disagreeing or being disappointed with policy or the actions of our leaders. But God has commanded us to be respectful, to speak evil, or not to speak evil, of our leaders, as it says in 1 Peter, chapter number 2. I think that if our country would heed this command, that we would speak evil of no man, uh, we would be in a much better situation. Concerning our president, concerning all those that are in authority. We see a division today. And while tragedy and circumstances that, that bring about such agony and heartbreak, at some point, kind of help unite. We see that shortly uh, beginning to disintegrate. And again, our generation that's coming up uh, have a completely different view. And as, as leaders and as men and women, we need to be uh, showing forth that example of showing great respect to those that are in authority. This generation, their response falls greatly on our shoulders. Where do our kids get off showing disrespect? not lifting up those that are in authority. It falls on our shoulders, my generation, those that are in the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s. We need to show forth a good example, praying, respecting, and subjecting ourselves to that higher power. I'm thinking of Mark chapter number 3, verse 25. It says, if a house has to be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. So we need to be standing together, united. And that's what we want to do here this morning. We want to honor you. We want to let you know we pray for you. We love you. We stand united with you and all that you want to accomplish for our community. But I would be amiss this morning if I don't I mention the latter part of 1 Timothy chapter number 2. Let me read the first part to give you the context and then we'll make a couple notes and then we'll be done. It says this. 
I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, for all that are in authority, that we be living a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. For there is, uh, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Now listen. Who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. It is God's desire. It is ours, but it is greatly God's desire that all men, that all women, would come to the knowledge, a saving knowledge, of who Jesus Christ is and what He has done for each and every one of you. Maybe some of you here this morning have heard of someone that talked about being saved or being born again or being a Christian. And maybe there are four examples. You say, well, I'm never going to be that kind of a person. So I want to stay away from that. Well, there's one of those in every crowd. We can say that about the fire department. We can, we can say that about the police department. We can say that about the governor's office, the mayor's office. There's always, there always can be a bad example. But they are an exception to the rule. Maybe there are some of you here this morning that have thought, well, I'm too bad to be saved. I've done some things in my life. There's no way that Jesus would ever love me or ever accept me. I'm here to tell you that that is a lie. You may believe it, but God will take you the way you are. He will save you. Becoming a follower of Jesus Christ, get this, has nothing to do with going to church. Being a follower of Jesus Christ has nothing to do with being baptized. Being a follower of Jesus Christ has nothing to do with just being better. Being a follower of Jesus Christ has nothing to do with religion. Being a follower of Jesus Christ has everything to do with salvation. See, salvation is a relationship. Religion can be a form of works. Do this, don't do this, and hopefully at the end your good works will outweigh well, 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 your bad works, and maybe you'll get there. That is not that is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is he he said it is finished when he died on that cross. He shed his blood on Calvary, and he says it is finished. He paid the ransom for your for your sins, and he wants all men and all women to come to a personal relationship with him. He did the work so that you didn't have to. There's nothing that we can do to ever earn our way to heaven. I mean, what's the amount? What's the dollar amount that we get? Well, what's the mountain that we climb? I mean, what, what, what links do we go to to show that we want it? There, there are no limits because there's no way that we can ever earn such merit in the eyes of God. The Bible says this, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because of our sin, it has separated us from God. The only thing that can reconcile us and bring us together is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. When he shed that blood for you and for me. When he calls you and you say, hey, I want to be saved, he will save you. I, 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 re I remember when I was a young man, and I didn't always do everything right. And I found myself in a courtroom one day, and traffic violation. And uh, we went through the whole process, um, guilty, for trying to get a lenient sentence, you know, uh, lenient fines. And uh, the judge was gracious to me and still had to pay out. But you know what? That courtroom hearing is very much like you and I coming into the courtroom hearing of, of heaven. And there's God the Father right there, at the, and he's at the head of the desk, right? He's the judge. And as you step forward, he, he asks you by name and say, Hey, have you sinned? And, and, and there's no way of getting around it. Yes, I've sinned. He says, Yes, I, I know that you've sinned. And because you have sinned, you must pay the price for your sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as you stand there sentenced and you're guilty, you're in a hopeless situation. No religion can bring you out of that. No religious leader can bring you out of that. Your, mom, your wife, your husband, no, no person can bring you out of that situation. That's just you and God. But then off to the side is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he looks and he says, hey, I'm willing to pay his spot. The sins that he committed, I will pay for them. God the Father looks over and says, you know what that means? He says, yes. So Jesus Christ paid that fine. Now, 
What did he do? He went to that cross. He suffered. He died. He bled for you and me. But in order for your sins to be paid for, you need to go to him and say, Jesus, would you take my sin? Would you be my Savior? Would you forgive me? And I will follow after you. Jesus, it just looks like this. I'll pay for those sins. I'll be your Lord and your Savior. And so in that courtroom room hearing this morning, um, that decision is yours. If I were to offer you a brand new truck, I have the keys, you must come up and get those keys for yourself. That's how salvation is in it, a free gift. You must come and grab those for yourself. Many of you here this morning have been given a second chance in life. And now, even now as I speak, you're given it an opportunity to call upon the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. Maybe you're here and you thought about eternity and wondered where you're going to go when you die. You just say, oh yeah, please call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe that He died on the cross for you and He's buried and rose again the third day. He'll say, He wants to, He loves you. The Bible says He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Today, in Florida in particular, there are people that are being devastated by this hurricane. Looking for some hope. And they'll get some hope, hopefully. You know what? That hope is going to be short lived. At some point in time in your life, this is just going to be a history of it. You know, one thing that we can't escape is what we're spending time doing. If you're here this morning and you've never thought about where you're going to go when you die, you would like to know. I'm going to, I'm going to be praying a prayer. If you mean this prayer in your heart, you want the Lord Jesus Christ to save you. He'll save you today. You can know for sure where you're going to go when you die. As citizens, as Christians, God expects us to subject ourselves to the higher power, to be in prayer for those that are in authority, and be respectful for those that God has placed in the position of authority in our lives. And we thank each and every one of you for the service. We thank you, wives and sons and daughters for all that you've done to support your husband or support your wife that are in these positions of authority. We know it's not an easy job. We thank you for taking those jobs. We love you and we do pray for you. In a moment, I'm going to pray. And then afterwards, we've got a special gift that we'd like to give to each and every one of you. But as I pray, halfway through, I'm going to be praying a prayer. This is a prayer of salvation. If you'd like to pray in your hearts and mean it uh, from your heart, uh, God will save you. He'll save you today. You don't have to worry about religion or, or if you're good enough or any of that because you're not good enough. None of us are good enough. God wants to save you. And I hope you call on him today. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to examine the word of God concerning our responsibility as citizens and as Christians. Today, Lord, we honor our first responders. We honor our civil servants. We thank you for uh, the sacrifice and dedicating their lives to protect and serve our community. We thank you for the citizens of our community who come out here today to support our first responders as well. Lord, help us as Christians to respect, to honor, to love, to put ourselves under the uh, authority of those uh, that are represented here this morning. Uh, we lift up and we pray for our president. And we pray for all the decisions that he's making, uh, even currently with all the devastation that's going on in Florida and uh, the devastation that's happened in, in Texas. And uh, Lord, give him wisdom. Uh, give him discernment. Uh, pray you surround him with men and women that have our country's best interests in mind. And may you just protect those that are in, a, in, in the path of this hurricane even now as we speak. We, we pray for our law enforcement and our, our first responders that are in Florida right now running uh, to these scenes of, of tragedy. Give them protection. Give them safety. Be with their families, Lord. Lord, we thank you that you've given us some instruction in how to respond to these. And while we may never always agree with everything, Lord, we lift them up and we, we honor their positions here this morning. God, thank you for leaving your position up in heaven and coming to this earth and becoming a man and going to that cross and shedding your blood for us that we might have life 
We thank you for the new life that we now have in Jesus Christ. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away before him. All things are become new. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for the change that you've made in us. The change brought about not by religion or good works, but a change that's been done by the Holy Spirit of God in us. Lord, I pray for these that are maybe concerned about where they're going to spend eternity. Lord, I'm going to pray and I just pray that. Lord, they want to be saved. They want to be a Christian. They want to be born again. And they will pray this prayer. We mean it in our hearts. If you're this morning and you would like to pray and ask God to save you, all you have to say is something like this from your heart. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, I know that you came to this earth and you went to that cross and you died a sinless, perfect man he took upon himself my sin. Thank you for shedding that blood for me and paying my penalty. Lord, I know they stuck you in the grave, but you did stay there. You rose again the third day. You're alive today up in heaven. And if you will, Lord, just take me the way I am. Forgive me and save me and make me a new creature in Jesus Christ. And we pray all these things this morning. Thank you this morning for being here. At this time, we would like to have uh, all of our fire department and their wives or special.